Welcome, everyone. I'm Jeremy Gez. I'm a professor of economics and international affairs at HEC Paris. It's a real honor to be here today and to host this uh, panel on a critical topic uh, entitled Powering Tomorrow, the Sustainable Energy, Waste Management, and Resources Revolution after COP28. Uh, three issues, sustainable energy, waste management, uh, resource revolution. We know they're omnipresent in our fight against climate change. We are know they are, are at the heart of the conversation on uh, the efforts we must undertake, and they are also some of the main preoccupations in the sustainable development goals offered by the UN. Um, we will not reach our targets. We will not mitigate the effects of climate change, and we will not be able to adapt to global warming uh, without substantial progress, without substantial and tangible solutions on this front, and without any real transformations on any of these issues. So today you will hear from uh, private and public sector leaders who stand at the forefront of this revolution. And um, we will explore together, you know, whether we can go beyond just the impression of a facade for sustainability and really come to meaningful uh, change going down the line, uh, including uh, 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 our efforts to uh, driving us towards a greener economy ultimately. Um, so please, well, uh, uh, help me welcome and join me in welcoming our panelists today, uh, Sheikh Dr. Sud Al Thani uh, from the Green Development and Environment Sustainability Department Director at the Ministry of Environment and Climate uh, Change in Qatar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Yves Ranou, the Chief Operating Officer and Recycling and Recovery uh, uh, at, uh, and Executive Vice President at Suez. Uh, thank you for joining us. Mr. Julien Pouget, President, uh, Middle East and North Africa for Exploration and Production at Total Energy. Thank you for joining us. And Mr. Uh, Franck Brichot, uh, Managing Director and Customer, uh, uh, Managing Director, Customer and Digital at Enoa uh, Niam. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmed Al Gamdi, CEO of Artificial Intelligence uh, Global. Uh, thank you as well for joining us. Um, this is my personal fight, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pessimism to go around these days, especially with the younger crowd I get to meet for better or for worse on campus. Uh, a lot of pessimism with regards to our ability to meet these goals, our ability to make a difference. And I was wondering if we could keep this crisp and short, as the organizers asked uh, uh, me just moments ago, can you give me one argument, one argument really that contradicts that pessimism and one thing that makes you think maybe uh, uh, there is a chance that we will uh, be able to tackle these challenges? Mr. Brichot, will you start? Of course, thank you for uh, having me. Let me just say that I don't mind having some pessimism in the room as long as it fuels, let's say, um, vision and implementation of a realistic vision. And that's where really NEOM comes into the play. Um, I think NEOM is often depicted as it's building a city. It's actually much more than that. It's a holistic play of building a whole country in all its dimensions. And actually, it's a country the size of Belgium. I'm Belgian myself, so uh, there is even an emotional link for me of uh, being already five years in, uh, in NEOM far away from, uh, from my family. But really, what keeps me there is this holistic vision. And it's not only about putting that vision on slides, it's about implementing that vision. And that's really what's currently happening as we speak in NEOM. Um, there was a lady a few panels ago from Bahrain who said, seeing is believing. Well, I would invite anybody coming over to NEOM and you will see that things are happening on the ground. Just to give you a few examples, um, NEOM is also about redefining livability. Um, yes, this leads to the 500 meters high city, which is almost twice the height of the Eiffel Tower, by the way. Uh, 170 kilometers of uh, two Eiffel Tires high buildings. It's about making it possible that people live within five minutes of any service, any activity they need to live their lives. We are currently designing and planning and will start with the first three modules uh, of that uh, city. 
but there's other locations in, in Neom that we are currently building as we speak. We will also not only protect nature, but we will restore nature. As we speak, we are rewilding the area of Neom. Neom is also about redefining business, again, as part of that holistic picture. And to build these high buildings, to deliver on all the promises that we've been doing, we will need a lot of innovation to help us doing so. And that's also one of the reasons I'm here, because we need partners from all over the world to help us delivering that dream. Which then finally brings, brings me to my own area. I'm part of the executive team of Enoa. Enoa is the company that will provide the whole of Neom, all users, all citizens, all tourists, all companies eventually with water and energy. And almost everybody needs water and everybody needs energy. And we will do that 100% renewable by 2030. As we speak, we are building together with Saudi Electricity Company the basic infrastructure. Uh, we're going to put in the market by the end of this year uh, almost a gigawatt of PV and more than one uh, gigawatt of wind power in Neom. And we are building, as already has been mentioned a couple of times, the biggest hydrogen plant in the world, which will produce 240 kilotons of hydrogen from 2026 onwards. And that's multiple times the global hydrogen production so far. So I don't mind the pessimism uh, as long as it drives us to bring realism into our implementation, and that's what we're doing in NEO. Yeah. Thank you for that. J Julien Pouget, we were saying uh, during the, the, the break, you know, if there's one area in the world where climate change is not a test anymore, it is the Middle East, it is the Gulf region, and we have evidence of this every single day. Do you share that optimism, and can you give us one argument that might contradict pessimism? Oh, so, uh, first, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me today. Uh, it's, uh, this year is a uh, big year for Total Energies because we were born actually 100 years ago in Iraq, not, not that far from GCC. Uh, and then we expanded in GCC and uh, we expanded very quickly because we, uh, you know, we, we were born in 1924. We found our first oil in 1927. We built our first pipeline three years later. First, and by that time, the largest tanker in the world. So it was a bit of pioneer spirit. And this is with this pioneer spirit that we are now embarking in our journey to, uh, to the energy transition. And you know, uh, there is pessimism. Okay, pessimism, why? Because today we are in a system which is heavily dominated by fossil fuels. More than 80% of energy today comes from fossil fuels. So, okay, this is what I would call the system A. And then we are building the system B, which is decarbonized, uh, based on lower consumption of energy, energy efficiency, renewables, uh, low carbon molecules. And this new system is currently under construction. There are good signs. Uh, I think last year, 44% of electricity generated in Europe was from renewables, uh, which is twice the percentage 10 years before. So it's a, it's a good sign. Last year, the world built 550 gigawatts of renewables. Yeah, also a huge effort. But obviously, we all agree it's insufficient. So, yes, we cannot build the system B, the new system, in a night. It takes time. My point is pessimism. You know, I, I, was, um, I had the chance to be... Uh, appointed to be in charge of the renewables business, building the renewables business of Total Energies uh, back in 2017. And in, at this time, we had basically uh, only uh, a share in the Shams power plant in uh, concentrated solar power plant in uh, Abu Dhabi, which was, uh, we were very proud of. So it was few hundreds of megawatts. And so we wanted to do much more because we wanted to embark in this transition journey. So what, what did we do? We took people from Total Energies, knowing how to execute projects, and then we attracted a lot of young talents. The young sirs you were speaking about, pessimism. So I told them, do you think that pessimism is a fuel for the change we have to implement? Or do you believe that it's action which will fuel the change? 
So apparently some of them were happy to, to join. We, we are now more than 2,000, I think, working in this uh, renewables business in Total Energies. In this period, we have grown from this few hundred megawatts in operation to more than 22 gigawatts by end of 2023. We are the number one uh, solar developer in the world, uh, I believe without the Chinese, but uh, if you expect the Chinese, we have been recognized as being the number one solar developer. We are investing more than 4 billion per year, and that I believe that first, this is a very good sign of action, very good sign for optimism, and the main sign for optimism is to see that uh, the youngsters, they were very happy to join and very happy to contribute, and they, they saw that action can drive results. It will take time, but transition is in motion. Thank you. And uh, on the Suez side, uh, Yves Ranou, when, when you look in your uh, area of expertise, treatment solutions, what trends do you see maybe that could give uh, us a better understanding of the progress we're making and the obstacles we may face going down the line? So by nature, I'm rather an optimistic person, so I will look at the bottle uh, half full. Um, so if we look at the megatrends, so megatrends are real tailwinds, I would say, for, for the waste ecosystem. First, waste is seen now as a resource, which is a very significant change in the way we perceive waste. Second, um, there is a big push for circular economy, decarbonization, renewable source of power, Countries, regulation are also pushing for the hierarchy of waste. So how do we treat in the best way waste so we don't systematically landfill? And finally, communities. Communities are extremely sensitive of their impact on the planet. And they expect everybody, public, private, to be as sensitive as they are and so to bring solutions. So these are the mega trends. Why I'm positive. Second point, it's because we have the technology. So, for instance, in France, we talk a lot about um, electrical vehicles, batteries. We got a large announcement of uh, gigafactories for batteries. Suez is a solution provider for recycling these batteries. So, in a nutshell, any ton of raw material which will enter the country will remain in the country. Second point, plastic, big topic. So there is a big uh, push, obviously, for recycling plastic. And Suez is also involved in the mechanical and chemical recycling of plastic. So the regulation is helping with the obligation to reintegrate what we call recycled plastic into the value chain. And Suez is able to bring solutions to industrials to address this requirement of the regulation. So I could go through several examples of this, but definitely I'm optimistic because I see a good combination of regulation, community expectations, technology, and finally money. Cash is available for financing waste management, resource management, to address the global challenges of the planet. So if we, thank you for that, get down to, to, to the concrete and to, we already have some concrete stuff. Uh, we have uh, very ambitious targets when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. Dr. Sood, I was wondering if you would be able to tell us, you know, the concrete steps uh, 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 your organization uh, uh, at the ministry is taking in terms of trying to help the economy uh, meet those uh, national and international goals. And uh, tell us, is this really about reaching those goals? Is this about reputation? How do we make sense out of the criticism uh, out of these goals? Are they good enough or something else? Um, first of all, thank you for this question, Jeremy, and Yanni, thank you for having me here. Um, yani, I understand the, the deep meaning of your question. Um, yani, we're in Qatar, uh, we have been always following what they call it a study uh, approach uh, when we tackle this type of topics. Huh? 
And sometimes it has been criticized for being slower uh, than uh, any other countries. Huh? But when we look at these type of uh, topics, we have to think about it from a more comprehensive uh, view. Huh? So, um, so when you talk about these targets, um, it might be good uh, as uh, an image huh, for an organization or a country. Huh? But we look. Uh, but is it uh, really uh, good, you know, realistic, uh, or not? This is something we need to be evaluated. Huh? And the other things you have to think about is uh, um, when you talk about uh, about topics like sustainability. Sustainability is, um, is it the right word? Huh? But when you talk about the climate change and the measures you use for the climate change, huh? you, c you keep hearing the buzzwords uh, sometimes huh? uh, in media. Um, but yeah, you have to you know, balance this uh, with, the, with the economic progress. Huh? So it's not only one angle, it's actually it has to be a balanced angle. Um, so in Qatar, um, we are very much committed uh, to our targets. Um, and as a proof of that, you know, in 2021, um, my ministry, the Ministry of Environment, it became an independent entity, uh, separate from the Ministry of Municipality. And to emphasize on our commitment on climate change, uh, the word climate change has been included as in the title of the ministry. In addition, uh, during the same year, um, Qatar, uh, in addition to other countries, has uh, established uh, the Net Zero uh, Producer Forum, uh, including countries like Saudi Arabia and Norway. Um, and this is, and it all shows the commitment of the, of the country. However, to be fair, you have to look from other angle. Huh? Um, so you're talking about uh, being fair to your uh, people, uh, providing the welfare. Um, so um, this is, you know, it's all mentioned in Qatar National Vision 2030. It told you about uh, and the lines you have to follow, you know, and then the strategies followed and told you, and we have so many strategies, we have frameworks uh, to talk about this topic. So from my view, when you talk about this topics, you have to think about three words. Huh? Um, so the three words is, um, you know, to be summarized is, um, um, fair uh, and uh, uh, realistic, uh, 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 energy, energy, um, no, fair and realistic uh, uh, transition uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for a secure, uh, uh, for a sustainable future with a secure uh, energy source. So the three words is fair and realistic and secure. Um, so I will give you some of examples, like yeah, we have so many works in the Ministry of Environment that we do, but I will give you a brief example, yeah, how the Ministry of Environment is trying to meet these targets. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways we have developed internally uh, a carbon management strategy, and uh, this, uh, this strategy uh, emphasizes uh, on uh, the role of um, cutting edge research. And we're working with entities locally, uh, like Qatar, uh, Qatar Research and Development and the Innovation Council, QRDI. Um, and uh, through them, you know, we try to introduce uh, these type of uh, ideas to be more marketable and scalable, uh, scalable at the national level, at the same time at an international level. Thank you. Maybe a quick reaction, Frank Julien, to, to this topic. I know we have uh, limited time, but... Well, at least for NEOM, from 2030 onwards, there is no doubt every kilowatt hour produced in neon will be green and also then every liter of desalinized water will be green. The transition towards it of course is the challenge and there we are using uh, and sailing on the, the waves of green energy deployment that is happening elsewhere in the kingdom and that we are buying to transition the, the period towards that, that moment in time. Julien? I just would like to react by saying you know uh, that giving a very concrete example of what we are doing, uh, by the way, together with uh, Qatar Energy in this case. It's in Iraq, so no, not very far, uh, where we were back uh, last year after almost a century. And we are building four mega projects for a total of 10, more than 10 billion dollars, actually, which I believe illustrate very clearly what we can do together uh, in this region to improve the situation from a climate change perspective. You know, if you go to the Basra area today, you have a lot of uh, uh, flaring, so uh, gas which is flared to the atmosphere, which is uh, obviously very bad from an environmental and climate change standpoint. And one of the characteristics of this project is that we will build a very large gas plant to treat the gas which is today flared in this region, 
Alors, a big part of it in two phases. And uh, this gas then treated, instead of being burned in a flare to go to the atmosphere, it will be injected in the gas grid of Iraq, and then it will feed uh, gas power stations, so which is much better. Instead of burning the gas for nothing, they will burn the gas to generate lower carbon electricity. It's not low carbon, but it's much better than other ways to do electricity. There is another better way to do electricity, which is solar. Solar, 1.2 gigawatts of solar that we will build in Iraq. It will be the first solar plant in Iraq of a significant size. And we start at 1.2 gigawatts. Uh, I think we, we should think about what type of companies could build not only solar farms, you know, in uh, Europe, in the US, uh, in Southeast Asia, but also in Iraq. It's not that simple. We'll do that, we'll start construction very soon, and we expect to have first electrons injected in the Iraq grid by end of 2025. We're also building a water project, and so on. So all these together is contributing to a much better usage, not only of the resources, uh, hydrocarbon resources of the country, but less flaring, better for climate, better for environment, uh, less water usage from the aquifers, which can be used for the population, because we'll take seawater, and so on and so on. So it's a huge project, which is, I think, a very good example of what can be done when we join forces in order to improve in a very, very material way uh, carbon emissions, uh, the electricity system, and at the same time bring more energy but better energy to, to a country. Please. I just want to comment, يعني, يعني this is um, what the point has been raised, يعني it's quite good an example of يعني, a partnership between government entities and uh, private uh, enterprise, especially in the case of uh, Total. Huh? So يعني, for Qatar, uh, we have to thank Total يعني, for many things. Uh, one of them is their support with the LNG, and the other one, as you mentioned, about uh, Qatar has a huge project, Al Kharsa project, uh, which is a solar power project. Uh, it's supposed to power Qatar 10% of the energy in the peak. Um, and this is a partnership with the Total, another uh, example for this project. Eh? So yani, this is any yani, shows example, as you, when you start your conversation about uh, pessimistic, eh? so pessimistic always yani, give you the innovation and the technologies and everything else. Eh? Without it, yani, you cannot move. Eh? Mr. Mr. Ahmed Al Gamdi, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sue. Um, but moving on to, to waste energy technologies, so they offer a solution, they offer uh, uh, sometimes meaningful solutions. There's plenty of criticism here again to go around about you know the extent to which they may actually favor you know uh, the wrong incentives when it comes to waste management and when it comes to waste reduction efforts. And I was wondering. Can you tell us, you know, how do we strike the right balance between those technologies and uh, trying to reduce waste altogether, uh, maybe circular economy principles? What are you seeing in your neck of the woods? Well, uh, thank you for the question. And looking at uh, the waste uh, to energy uh, technologies maturity, I, uh, I agree. They are not really uh, uh, mature enough uh, to uh, eliminate, uh, you know, uh, uh, Non-environmentally friendly products, so we can see, you know, high uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, for example, we see uh, the waste is still there, so it's not 100% recovery. Sometimes, you know, these technologies they also burn, you know, uh, recyclable, recyclable, uh, you know, products that we could reuse. So, uh, but from the other side, they are, you know, really uh, good enough to kick start more uh, technologies, more you know, programs uh, on this front. Uh, to, to link to a circular economy, uh, I think uh, I would say the government should play more role uh, in setting regulations to promote the use of these, you know, waste to energy technologies, recycling technologies. They also need to, to be leader uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, investing on these technologies, deploying them in their countries. Uh, when it comes to industrial uh, you know, entities and sectors, they also need to invest uh, in deploying these available technologies and also 
you know, bringing more uh, technologies that can eliminate the remaining, uh, you know, waste and, and emissions. Uh, I, I would cite one uh, maybe good example in Saudi is, is what Sabic, uh, the petrochemical, is doing, where they instituted a new uh, production line for consumers, you know, products out of recycled plastics. And now they are putting a program called, I think, Price, you know, uh, Circle, uh, to, to promote this to, uh, to their other, uh, you know, uh, clients and, and subsidiaries as well. Uh, so I think in, in a nutshell, you know, uh, also the community, the populations or the public sector, they also need to respect these regulations and apply them. Thank you. Yves Ranou, from the viewpoint of uh, Suez, how, how do you see this uh, playing out? So first, we need to just acknowledge that energy from waste is, uh, is an asset extremely, uh, I would say, resilient and flexible in its implementation. So it can be pretty, um, I would say, uh, small in size, close to the cities and so on. First, close to the industries as well. Second, energy from waste is not a hobby job. It's a mainstream. In several countries, you have uh, projects. And when I talk about projects, I, I talk about billions and billions of, uh, of euros of projects. Why? Because it's a relatively good solution for cleaning cities, if I may say, in respect of the waste hierarchy. Okay? And second, produce electricity to a great extent decarbonized, and steam. And populations and industries are looking for decarbonized electricity and decarbonized steam. In addition, the regulation is extremely strict in terms of emission control, with uh, online monitoring and so on. So it's not uh, fumes which are released in the atmosphere uh, uh, without any control, so very high control of, of the emissions. And finally, we see more and more projects where there is carbon capture technology combined to green hydrogen to produce SAF, so sustainable aviation fuels. In addition, we collect the hashes and ashes go back to road construction. Uh, so I spent 20, 25 years in renewable power. I've always been for an energy mix. And in my opinion, we should learn from the energy crisis we got and look objectively at the benefits potential downsides of all the possible solutions. And let's not put energy from waste in the spotlight for reasons which, in my opinion, are either managed or manageable or relatively minor compared to the benefits this kind of asset can have in several countries. And just to close on the point, France is currently going through a full renewal of uh, municipal concessions, so 20 to 25 years contracts of energy from waste. So yes, we have, for instance, nuclear power in France, but France is also investing quite a lot in energy from waste. Uh, just... Moving on, similar question for, for Ahmed and Frank on, on digital technologies that seem to be, uh, uh, you know, a uh, starting point of many of the conversations about our ability to do better and our ability to optimize. Uh, there is the energy consumption issue uh, 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 related to the environmental footprint of these technologies themselves that may be overlooked. So is there a way to basically strike a right balance between these two and uh, to find a really truly uh, uh, a meaningful, uh, sustainable approach? Who wants to start? You've been volunteered. Uh, you know, I think uh, everybody's looking at digitalization and AI very optimistically. 
you know, there are drawbacks for sure when it comes to energy consumption of some of the technologies. If we look, uh, you know, for example, in data centers now expansions into more, uh, you know, uh, localizing the clouds and the data into data centers, building a huge size data centers require high calling, you know, uh, uh, basically energy. And, and this is, you know, will come with um, its, you know, drawbacks when it comes to consumption uh, and energy. But from, uh, you know, the other, uh, you know, positive aspects of, of really the digitalization uh, is there, especially when we look at uh, AI capabilities, what AI has brought to us. The uh, fourth industrial revolution when it comes to data integration and building the data lakes uh, and, you know, uh, integrating the data together so you can bring more value. Uh, you know, the value of the data is, is really the next oil. I know, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the Bahraini lady said human resources is the next oil, but, you know, human resources are really the ingredients and, the, you know, the catalyst uh, when it comes to use, data use. So I think, uh, you know, there are many technologies nowadays that AI is bringing to really uh, uh, reduce uh, the footprint or the environmental footprints. Uh, for example, uh, satellite imaging and using video analytics uh, to quantify emissions. And now it's really used by regulators, uh, international entities to put more, uh, really I would say, enforcement in reducing emissions. Uh, can countries and companies, they started to build you know, uh, carbon sequestration, emission reduction programs like what Julian was saying about, you know, zero flaring. These are not economic projects. They came because there was a driver. Emissions were already, you know, reported by somebody else. So now this enforced really countries and companies to put programs to quantify their emissions and to reuse as much as they can, as, uh, as much as they can these uh, uh, ways. Another, you know, uh, good example to cite here is demand forecasting uh, using AI, uh, you know, tools. This was not there before, and but now we see companies they are really having the data and they are learning from the history through AI technologies to quantify the demand and plan their production, so they can reduce the waste and they can reduce uh, any surplus production basically from their facilities. And uh, there are many good examples nowadays in the AI, so I think AI is really going to bring value to the, you know, the circular economy in general. Thank you. Frank, a reaction perhaps? Yeah, I think there's a ba basic uh, assumption here that builds on emissions from energy that assume that the energy mix you're using is non-renewable. Of course, if you're in a 100% renewable context, you don't have that emission problem. Having said that, and that's one of the inconvenient truths of uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable energy 100% will not have the opportunity we have, for instance, in Europe, and I've worked 25 years in Europe, I know that we introduce renewable energy, but we still have the safety net of traditional energy to shield off some of the inconveniences that renewable energy brings. We in NEOM, we're going to build a 100% renewable energy system. We won't have nuclear, we won't have gas, we won't have other sources of energy when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. So if we want to implement that system, we need to bring into the game demand side management because we cannot ask the sun, please shine more or the wind, please blow more. So instead of managing the supply side, which we do in a traditional system A, as Mr. Pouguet uh, named it, in system B, we can't ask the supply side to do more. So we need to go to the demand side. And that's where we enter with all the consumers, which is, by the way, also part of the parler vrai that is missing in the whole ESG debate, around what's the impact on the consumers, on the customers. It's like the range anxiety with electric vehicles. Everybody thinks electric vehicles are going to solve the issue. Well, to some extent, but you also need to, bring, to, to accept some inconveniences. Same is with 100% renewable energy. But what we do know is we will only be able to solve and manage the enormous amounts of data with the help of digitization and artificial intelligence. So 100% renewable without AI will not exist. Once it exists, 
it's 100% renewable, so there's no emission problem. Thank you. Maybe one last word, Dr. Sood. You know, there's this uh, whole uh, debate, pervasive sense of, you know, we're running out of time, whole debate between those who want to impose specific mandates uh, 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 on carbon emissions and those who still hope, you know, there may be a, a system of incentives and a system of public and private partnerships to solve the, the, the and, and reach the targets we need to reach. I was wondering if you could share a few concluding thoughts on uh, where you stand and what you see on this debate. So, and from my perspective, especially that we are here in France, uh, I will talk about uh, any from perspective from Qatar and France. Uh, and you, you notice, uh, and recently, France were really good. Huh? And in 2021, they introduced uh, carbon tax. Huh? And I think it's uh, one of the any strongest countries in the European Union to have this commitment. Huh? But when you look at it from, uh, and, and you find out that attitude is kind of similar uh, across Europe regarding uh, um, the carbon taxation, especially when you talk about uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, CPAM. Huh? But when you talk, uh, any, so it's, it's uh, a good mechanism uh, any, to make us any, develop the industries. Uh, uh, but when you look at it from example, from our perspective, uh, um, so far uh, six out of, uh, actually they have, they have six, I think, uh, project, and all, all of these six are something that Qatar produce. Uh, um, and I think the second highest uh, any product is aluminum after, after oil and gas uh, from Qatar. Huh? So from our side, يعني, we have been doing a lot. Uh, as I said, I'm talking about uh, research, innovation, all this type of stuff. Uh, and it is kind of moving the market as well. So the market is interested in this. Uh, um, so when you have a top-down approach, it's kind of it's kind of not fair to everyone. Huh? <laughs> um, so you have to find a way, uh, in a way that you have the balance between between the top-down and between uh, the incentives, the bottom-up. Huh? Um, and I like, and in Qatar we have been doing a lot. Huh? So some of the heavy or intensive energy industries have been looking into uh, using renewables, uh, making this industry more efficient. And I know there's a lot of work done by, for example, by Qatar Energy. Huh? Yani, as a Ministry of Environment, we can see their work. Huh? And we can see the, the work of other uh, oil and gas companies working in Qatar. And it's not limited to them. So there's a lot, so many other uh, entities. So in Qatar, Qatar, I think this was one uh, one of the earliest uh, yani GCC countries to talk about uh, empower, yani moving the, the what you call it the economy from carbon based to uh, human uh, human knowledge based, uh, um, and because of that, yani as an example mentioned earlier about Total, Total was a good example, huh? Yani uh, when you talk about uh, yani there is a challenge uh, and we find a way to move around it. So to, to keep it short, uh, I like the way the, the French have dealt with this. Uh, um, I think currently it's not uh, it's not fair, but I think I think uh, in a way, uh, yani we can f f find a balance between uh, mandate and economic uh, incentives. So what the, the French did, for example, when they introduced the carbon uh, carbon pricing, uh, yani mandate, uh, at the same time uh, you find that there is a way out. You found out that. Uh, for example, uh, there has been subsidies, there have been tax breaks uh, for uh, so, uh, so a renewable energy project or solar project. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, what they did, they did with, uh, for example, with the wind power. Uh, so the French, uh, they find a way to balance between incentive and mandate. Uh, with the wind power, what they did, uh, they made uh, that uh, they have a fixed tariff uh, for, uh, for uh, energy produced from wind. Uh, uh, and, and this has encouraged a lot of uh, incentives regarding this. Uh, at the end of the day, we are all here today uh, to share knowledge, to have the technologies, uh, to exchange the, the you know, between different parties, uh, the GCC and in my case, uh, Qatar specifically, and France. Thank you for that. Finding the right incentives, making sure the technology flows, uh, making sure this dialogue between public and private corporations continues. I think that uh, gives a really powerful roadmap for the future and for continued conversations like in this forums. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you very much for this panel.